Located in the heart of Dublin's north inner city, one place has provided acute paediatric care for almost 140 years. A home from home which offers safety at times of uncertainty. This building tells a story of hope, determination and strength. And tonight we go behind its doors to share the stories from the theatres and wards, to meet the staff who dedicate their lives to the care of Ireland's children, and to follow the journey of families and their little patients who are in need of vital and life-saving treatment. Welcome to Temple Street Children's Hospital. Monday morning at Temple Street. In the intensive care unit, a young baby named Jack has been transferred from accident and emergency for further investigation. We had him in three weeks ago uh, with bronchiolitis. He was, he was kept in for a week. Uh, two weeks ago he got out. Then um, yesterday he was, he was very sick. He was grand yesterday morning. And, um, they started getting sick then about 2 o'clock, so he was very sick. He was brought straight into a resource. They are giving him loads of different things, so, um, and they just extended with treatment for meningitis. The top of his head was, was fairly swollen, so the, the doctor last night told us that he might have an infection in and around his head, so they gave him uh, antibiotics, done a scan of his head as well, everything was grand, so he's been doing all right, so we're just, we're just waiting. This, uh, this afternoon, the results of the blood test will come in, so um, just waiting to hear back on that. Jack came in during the night uh, at about one o'clock this morning, and he's uh, nearly five months old, and he just came in with a um, very high-pitched cry, and um, we seemed to be very irritable. When he came in to casually then, um, he would have been assessed, and. Um, Basically, they're treating him for acquired meningitis, is the picture it looks like at the moment. There are two types of a meningitis, there's a bacterial and a viral. A bacterial you treat usually with antibiotics, a viral is like any sort of a virus that you get. And basically we all carry that in our nose and you might never get meningitis. Sometimes then babies in particular because they're smaller. Um, and Jack had been a little bit ill a few weeks ago. He had a bronchiolitis, which is kind of like a respiratory infection. So his immune system was a little bit low, and um, that may be one of the reasons why he got sick now. It's a kind of, it's an infection in your brain. It's where there's irritability in your brain, um, and you can have different forms of meningitis. Some can have a rash, which is with the bacterial, and others then don't, there isn't a rash present. Particularly with the bacterial meningitis, that can spread rapidly. There are a huge amount of follow-on kind of disabilities and um, neurological deficits that you can have from meningitis if it's not treated early. I know how serious, like last night I was told it was real serious, like and stuff like that. So I know how sick, serious and sick he is. When he, was, when he did open his eyes yesterday, he was just sort of looking out the side. He wouldn't look at anybody. He was just sort of looking, looking past you, you know. So, scary few hours. Is it a new one? No, it's a new It's the next level. No, it's a new course. Oh, new course, excuse me. Andrew has arrived at the hospital ahead of surgery. Today in theatre, he will receive a series of Botox injections to help with his mobility. He's here today to get casts on his, on his two legs because he, he walks on his toes. And, um, I got them in junior infants. We had the same procedure done about two years ago. The fact that he's grown so much now, he needs to have it done again. 
when he was when he started to walk, he was falling over a lot, and he was constantly up on his toes. You know, we'd have to help him up and down steps and stairs and stuff like that. So the, the warning signs were there. But as he started to grow, the more he went up on his toes, and then we had to get get it diagnosed. Then that it was a mild form of cerebral palsy, diplegia, and that as he would as he was growing, the condition would get worse because his uh, his uh, muscles weren't stretching. So this Botox helps the muscle to stretch as he grows, but it, he has to be put in cast every now and then so that his, his bones and his uh, muscles grow together. He loves everything, like he loves soccer and football and don't you Andrew? Yeah. But like um, he hasn't them on today, he does wear splints on his legs normally, or his foot goes into them and they're tied around, so he wears those and they keep him down as well. But just you need, we need the, the cast on for to work on him better as well. Yeah, as he grows, it's a, it's a, we're basically playing catch up, trying to keep up with it because his, his muscles and, and bones aren't developing at the same rate. And this is a, one way of keeping him, keeping his feet on the ground. Staff nurse Denise Trainer will accompany Andrew to theatre. He is what we call a toe walker in that he walks with his toes down and his heels up. For him, I suppose in a certain way, he has been used to it. Yeah, okay. But as he develops, it would cause him problems with balance. Mm. His treatment today is that he will be taken to theatre, Botox injected, and this is to release the pull on those muscles. It's just that every time he grows, he gets his sport to grow. He's after growing, what, an inch and a half there? And... His legs have grown an inch and a half in the last few months. Is that right, Andrew? Yeah. yeah. That's why all his trousers are too sharp for him. <laughs> Isn't it? You know the way they have to wear a mask? Yes. You're going to get one of those masks. Oh. Do you remember it from the last time? No. Probably not. No, a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and what happens is there's a smelly gas in it. But there's a trick to it. All right. What you do is you breathe into your mouth and not through your nose and then it's on the And then you fall off the seat. And then we do, then we fix your caps. Is that the plan? It is. Now, what do you press this button here? My ball of fluff, how you sweet <laughs> Meanwhile, in the St. Michael's ward, two familiar faces have arrived at the clinic. Sophie from Sligo and Michaela from Mayo both attend the hospital on a regular basis. Michaela's six years old. Um, she was diagnosed when I was 18 weeks pregnant. The new thing that her kidneys were polycystic. So initially they had said she probably wouldn't make it at all. She was sick an awful lot. She'd come home for a week maybe and she'd be up again to Dublin for two weeks and she'd be home for a day and she'd be back up again sick the whole time. Sophie, um, she, was, she was diagnosed in 2009. She was about a year and a half. And then she just got sick over a week or so. Pig. Pig. We're going to Temple Street now for almost the past five years for dialysis. She realises her kidneys aren't working. She's always saying, when I get my new kidney, I'll be able to do this. Then she diagnosed that she had um, Willem's tumour in her two kidneys. She was she got very early. Brutal. It was blown to the face. You just couldn't comprehend. You can't understand when I'm so small or so young. You actually have cancer. Before she was born, we got no hope. You know that she's a survivor. That, but she's been great. Like she's been through a lot, and she seems to be strong and a great little fighter. Like she's had, she had six operations in the first three months of being in Crumlin. So she went through the mill that time, but she's come back now, and she's all her heroes back and everything. So she's, she's delighted with that. Aren't you? you love your hair, don't you? Both girls require regular dialysis treatment three times a week to remove toxins and excess fluid from their bodies. This is the only centre we have for children, purely because um, where we have all the experts here. And it's such a small number of patients on hemodialysis for children in the country in comparison to adults. But for that, though, uh, it means that the majority of patients are travelling long distances, and that can be gruelling. Yay. Outside the intensive care unit, Jack's parents wait for news, whilst the medical team examine him further. He has had tests done last night. 
that you will have a lumbar puncture done and that's where they take some CSF which is the fluid around your brain and that goes down along your spinal column and we take it from the spine. Again, it's a um, definitive test again for meningitis and it's part of checking the type of bug there is. And we've been looking at his temperature and his blood pressure and his heart rate and his colour and all of that is part of your assessment really. Three bottles to fill. I was I was back. So I did just have today because it's too upset to all the webs standing in the water. Well, so I wouldn't have stayed in there anyway. The worst yeah, feeling anyone would want to go through seeing that, that child like that. Especially not only after being here like two weeks ago. It's not nice at all. Samples from the lumbar puncture are taken to the laboratory and examined alongside the other blood specimens. Meningitis is one situation in a children's hospital where you definitely have to shoot first and ask questions later because it is such a, a potentially serious disease. Uh, so in Jack's case he was started on uh, the appropriate antibiotics and then samples were taken, a blood sample and a sample of spinal fluid which is sent to the laboratory and what we do in the laboratory is to try and determine well is this meningitis and if so what's causing it so for example we look for the presence of white blood cells in the spinal fluid which indicates that there's some sort of inflammation or per perhaps infection going on there uh, we also try to grow the bacteria from the, the spinal fluid to see if they're causing the meningitis where we're able to use a test called PCR this is a what's known as a molecular test that allows us to detect very very small amounts of the DNA from the bacteria that cause meningitis, either in blood samples or in spinal fluid samples. And what this means is that we can actually make a diagnosis of meningitis in a matter of hours, where it, traditionally these sort of tests would take a couple of days. He's still under close observation, really, basically. He is still quite irritable and crying, quite a high-pitched cry, but he does settle at times and he was smiling a little bit. So there are all the things you're looking at um, and you would hope that that wouldn't change at the moment. Um, but of course you, you don't know that really. Hi, I have the CSF results on Jack Robinson. His white cell count is 7,680. His red cell count is 111. In the day ward, Andrew is called for surgery. Once in theatre, Ms. Cassidy will administer Botox into his limbs. Andrew is a little boy who has cerebral palsy, so he has some undue tightness of his lower limbs and tends to walk on his toes. We have him on a physiotherapy program. If that's sufficient for children, we won't do anything more. If that is not sufficient to get them comfortably walking with their feet flat on the ground, we give them some Botox to relax their muscles a little bit. Keep it into his jersey so he doesn't lose it. Just swing around, Dad. I'll tie that. It's hard to let him go, like you know. But uh, it won't be too long, Eleanor. Twenty minutes will be all over, hopefully. Would that be nicer. <laughs> Cerebral palsy is a condition which interferes with your. Uh, walking and your balance and your muscles and even your sensory system. So the range of children we see with cerebral palsy is vast. We see children you would hardly recognize them, hardly recognize as they walked down that there was any problem with them, to the children who are severely affected are never going to walk and need total care. And then we have children in between who can get around but have a little bit of difficulty. So we try and make it as easy as possible for them to get around. Botox eases their muscles or relaxes them a little and makes it easier for them to walk or easier for us, for us to fit splints on them. Giving the Botox is actually very simple. It's just like getting a vaccination. Uh, it's a drug that we uh, put into their muscles and it helps to relax them. The bit that's a little bit harder is to examine each child, see which muscle they particularly require it into and set up then to actually do the treatment for them. I was wondering what was keeping him when he wasn't coming back. So. Yeah. No, Dave has to do that. I couldn't go down, down with him. I'm a basket case. <laughs> Bad enough. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm glad now he's gone in and he'll be back in half an hour. Is that what you said? Yeah. Half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Twinkle, twinkle.
twinkle. Meanwhile, Michaela and Sophie have been on dialysis for almost three hours. For their parents, the hope of one day receiving a transplant is foremost in their minds. And downstairs, one little boy who has recently undergone such surgery has arrived for a checkup. Joseph is a patient who required dialysis at home every night. So literally seven nights a week, parents had to put him on the machine for, in the end, what ended up being 16 hours sometimes. He had no urine output, so he was restricted on how much fluid he could drink. 500 mils may sound okay, but that included literally any fluids that went into, say, cornflakes, into a cup of tea, jelly, soup, all of that gets included. So for a child to be told constantly that you just can't drink what you want to drink, it becomes a battle between the parents and the child. Okay. Obviously, if, you, if your day, if 16 hours of your day is taken up with dialysis, it doesn't leave a lot of time for real life to happen. So school, play, parents have to work. It has a massive impact on the whole family. Waking up every morning, as I said, after 16 hours or 18 hours of dialysis, facing a lot of tablets to take, not being allowed to take a huge amount of drink with it, and then to try and get him to get the energy to go to school. Um, you know, he, he did all the hard work. He had to go through that day in, day out for a number of years before he was lucky to get his transplant. We were told that um, it would prob probably be a call in the middle of the night and true to form was about um, I think about a half half twelve. You just go up, get up and you go, they just tell you. Okay. Got his childhood back. It's great for the um, the other children. It's great for him, it's great for us. But to say he's um, he's a wee character that grabs life by the scruff of the neck anyway and it's good to see him taking that chance. As the day nears an end for Michaela and Sophie their parents look to the journey ahead and the prospects of freedom which a transplant will bring. She never complains about it. The only time now and again she might say, oh, I wish I had a new kidney. I could go swimming or I could go do this and that with the other kids. Like, you kind of get used to coming up, even though, as I say, it would be great if we didn't have to be coming up. Like, you know, Michaela would have a more normal life. She's the most popular um, blood group, so that's a good start, you know. So, um, can basically go on the waiting list and wait to get the call. Hopefully, you know, people actually, you know, do sign the, the care of the Queen's an awful lot, you know, to get that, get someone to donate a kidney to you. So hopefully she will get the transplant, you know, that we need so badly, because if she got the transplant, I mean, it would be brilliant. It would be a whole new lease of life for her and for us as well, of course. I would never have thought of signing the care until this happened and now, you know, anyone I'd see, i say, you know, sign your care because it means life to someone else after us. Downstairs in the laboratory, the results of Jack's test have been finalised. In Jack's case, we were able to very quickly confirm the presence of the meningococcus, the, the bacteria that is um, one of the commonest causes of bacterial meningitis. Uh, this particular strain of meningococcus is what's known as a type B strain. Type B is the, the commonest type of uh, meningococcus that, that we see in Ireland. It's a strain that's very readily treated with antibiotics, and in most cases, children do very well. Now, unfortunately, there is a small number, there are a small number of children that even when we're able to make the diagnosis, even when they're starting antibiotics early, can develop complications, and unfortunately, a small proportion of children do still die from meningitis, and that's why it's really important that we're able to diagnose it and treat it as quickly as possible, and hopefully to uh, develop further vaccines to prevent it. Jack is transferred to the St. Patrick's Ward where he continues to receive treatment. And while he sleeps, his dad waits by his bedside. Luckily enough, when we brought him in force, they, they treated him for it straight away without really knowing what it was. They knew it like it was some sort of infection, so luckily enough, they treated him straight away for that. And we got him in early, that was the main thing as well. The nurse came around and says that they, there was a lot of white uh, blood cell build up on, on the back of his spine, so that's how they knew that they knew what it was. But uh, again, we're getting him in early. That, that, that's all they were saying, get him in early. Once you got him in early, was the best thing you could have done. 
And he just went from being perfect Sunday morning to nothing at all, just asleep. <laughs> Tried giving him a drink. He took the drink, but it was coming straight back up. Luckily, Jack was picked up quickly, treated very promptly, but it can go wrong as well. Even despite early treatment, it's an unpredictable and serious illness. And, you know, there's a not insignificant uh, rate of death with the condition. In this situation, I think both Jack's parents were very clued into the idea that he wasn't himself at all, that they noticed a rash. They clearly thought this rash was something that they'd not seen before, and they responded very quickly to it. It's unbelievable. Like, thinking of it now, like, me and me and her to be saying, God, thank God we brought him in, thank God we brought him in early, because it was the best thing we could have done for him. The worst thing is seeing that child in that, in that kind of state. Of, you wouldn't like to wish it on anybody. In the day ward, Andrew is back from theatre. The surgery went very well. Again, he's a very happy child who was quite okay going to theatre. He was a little um, unsettled when he came back and his temperature was a little up, but that settled again once he's had his drinks and something to eat. The high temperature in itself is, un is unusual, but there's nothing to say the child cannot develop that. In some cases, the Botox works quite well. It might work for a year, it might work for three months, it might work for six months, and it varies child to child, so that's why they're reassessed. They usually have a care program anyway. Botox to, should just make their general care easier for the children who are more severely affected. Yeah, it's like walking on the moon. <laughs> they call them his moon shoes, don't they? He'll be doing moon moon moonwalking next, right? So are you delighted to be going home, Andrew? It's been a long day, but we're glad to be going home. You can still do physio with it. They can still work physio on it with these on them. But we have physio all the time anyway, so to continue with it, just... Mostly um, stretching. Stretching exercises. On the muscle, like, to get us wheel down. You know, the Botox just gives it more... Uh, like a rubber band makes it stretch more, like... You know. Glad it's all over? Yes. Okay. <laughs>